everybody, this is Casey Allen, co-creator of Voodoo Child, and you are watching Two Geeks Talking. Hi, this is Peter Woods, co-creator of Voodoo Child, and you're watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by two very talented One's a writer, one's an artist, but they are both co-creators of this amazing new comic called Voodoo Child, which is also has a volume one and a volume two, has a Kickstarter going on right now. We're joined today by Casey Allen and Peter Woods. How are you guys doing? We're, we're good. Like Pete and I have done this like step-by-step step the whole way. It's been a, all this madness is a coalescing of, of, of two minds. He has been with me every step of the way. He actually came to me about doing a comic together, which I didn't think that I was good enough to have anybody want me to write a comic with them. So for those that don't know about Voodoo Child, and I'll leave this up to both of you guys, uh, tell us what it's all about. Voodoo Child is a story about destiny, ultimately. And do you, con do you actually have control of your own destiny? When you have a choice in life, is that choice predetermined or are things set out for you beforehand and do you actually ha do you have a choice in things can you actually change your own destiny in a big high level sort of way that's what the book is ultimately about from a, another aspect in a fart jokes and horrors and zombies <laughs> it's about baron samedi the god of death or the lower of death lower of death or god of death lower lower. lower 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 of death basically trying to shirk his responsibilities he, he's he's fed up of being this deaf dude. He just wants to ascend to a new level. So he's getting a grunt in the Vietnam War entwined in his machinations and basically wants to hand the mantle to him. This guy, Max, who he's trying to hand the mantle to, does he actually have a choice in this? Is this something that he can decide? That's the story of Voodoo Child. I think it's, it's a great story. I love the first volume. I love the fact that you have great action overall. I love the, the writing. It didn't take me long to get into it because you just, you threw everything at, at the person at once. And I love the fact that, you know, you're forced to think, you know, a little outside of when you're reading this, you know, what is the story? Who are these characters? Why are they so important? And who's the, the awesome, you know, God of death there? Cause I'm really intrigued by by that guy. He seems just like an amazing character to write. Yeah. He, he was super fun to write. And it was something that, I gained appreciation for him as I went along. Uh, ultimately, the, the story is about Max. I was worried about overshadowing him with this, this crazy, you know, voodoo, like the voodoo hierarchy. He, he's kind of like a saint. Anyway, I, I was worried about overshadowing him. He's really kind of taking on a mind of his own as I write him. I have like a particular voice in my head for his dialogue, and it's so fun letting that just go wide open and he, he is a bastard like he is a terrible 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 being who hates humanity like so much that he's just peaced out he's like screw you guys i'm moving on being able to write that and then have somebody go you're what now no we're in the refusal of the call stage right now as to what max decides to do is anybody's guess at this? I mean, I don't know. Obviously, Pete knows. We're not going to tell you though, because you got about spoilers. <laughs> but yeah, we're we're in in the stage where he he is completely and totally refusing that call and learning a little bit more about himself. In, in the first volume, Max not only realizes that he's been uh, tasked with something that is completely and totally beyond his pay grade. But he uh, realized he accidentally kills his best friend. He has to deal with that. He's dealing with that emotional weight. And then his best friend comes back and his best friend is not the same. And uh, so that character is really fun to write. In the back of my head, I kind of think of him as uh, Mr. Bill from the old SNL sketches. Um, oh, Mr. Bill. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I will write a note in the script or, or I'll talk to to pete and i'm like is this too much and pete will double down I'm like no let, yeah let's let's freaking do this so 
having Pete on as, as a co-creator and a collaborator on this is he is only encouraging my stupidity. <laughs> Let's talk about these characters. You know, what did you draw from to create these characters? And this is for either of you. So Good question. Yeah, go on, Case. On the outset, the idea behind who they were, I did a lot of research into uh, Haitian voodoo and even some uh, New Orleans voodoo lore. That stuff, you know, that's like the the base floor. I've always been interested in that stuff. My, my grandma in North Carolina lived across the street from a woman who uh, was a voodoo practitioner. And she gifted my mother with a, a grigri bag one time when I was a small child. And it scared the shit out of my mom because she didn't know what it was or what it did. And uh, now that's like living in a sock drawer somewhere. I, I've always kind of been interested in that stuff. I think because of that way back when I would play with this lady's grandkids. And then after the, the terrible, terrible earthquake in Haiti um, a few years ago, I always kind of wondered like, what would, what would they think? Like the, the Haitian, uh, like the Loa about what is going on in the world today. If they were seeing what's going on in Haiti, they're seeing, you know, the, their people just, you know, scattered to the winds and how would they deal with that? And uh, would, would they care? Talking with Pete about it, you know, you can't get anywhere with a character. I mean, you can think about it all day, but until it becomes reality on a page, that character doesn't come to life. And talking with Pete about it and him designing the characters has been uh, so much life has been brought to the story just by Pete's designs alone. Adding to that, like the conversations we have about the book, I mean, it's truly a collaborative effort. Yeah, so design-wise, uh, it's quite interesting because one of the first characters I drew was uh, Max, who I just did this doodle of this Vietnam grunt with a little ace in his hat, basically called, nicknamed Ace, who's a card player from Harlem, who got, like in my head, who's from Harlem, got conscripted in the Vietnam War. Your sort of archetypal Vietnam sort of grunt that you see in so many films. So he was like the initial sketch I did. And then Casey was like, yeah, so he's got a mate who's called London. And I was like, why is he called London? He was like, because you're from London, dude. I was like, uh, okay, fair enough. <laughs> so the design for him, um, basically we, we envisioned him being a photojournalist. Um, essentially, that's the reason why he's in over in Vietnam taking photographs in the first place in issue one. Then I just wanted to explore, expand on that a little bit more because um, we, we decided that he used, he'd be doing investigative journalists into this whole other subplot we have going on with regards to like the drug running which is super interesting the backstory for that one which Casey can fill you in on but then I just wanted to do a little homage to Kurt Cobain essentially which is why when he's in his actual body he's got like big lamb chops because if Kurt Cobain was around in the 70s he would have had big lamb chops in my head so yeah that's where he came from so um, Baron Samedi the design for him was fairly easy to do because he's an already established character with you know voodoo and um all that sort of thing and there's like lots of lots of stuff like there's used to be a either a marvel or a dc character called baron samedi as well mm -hmm. so it's fairly easy to design him but it's just a matter of just drawing him in my own style so you know that's where the design of him developed from and the initial idea visually for him was to always have any dialogue he spoke similar to the way todd klein did sandman with the reverse balloons and then from that, I was like, well, let's give him a big coat because big coats are cool. Uh, question for then for both of you as well. Now, creating this world, you know, why did you decide to start in the, in the Vietnam era? I wanted to do something that was like not current. You get the character and then you put them in a situation. With this, I wanted to go as wild as possible. You're already trying to not get your ass shot off. And then you find out that... Uh, you're being selected as as the next embodiment of death that's a lot and so you know having the you know the impending doom on top of impending doom on top of impending doom i thought was kind of a, a fun thing I, I sent a few uh proposals to to pete i, th I think pretty pretty immediately it was like yeah this, this one this one so <laughs> And it, it was like bare bones. Pete and I fleshed it out. It was just interesting because it's it's been a while since I've seen a comic just 
thrown into the Vietnam era. I think it's a it's a very chaotic period in in history, not only from an American standpoint, but from a you know bringing in the supernatural to it. I I think that's a great a great segue. <laughs> I mean, why wouldn't the the god of death be in Vietnam type deal? It would work out really well. The art style is is perfect. I think for it, I thought it was just really beautifully done overall too. The colors just really pop. So I got a great sense of the grittiness of of what you're trying to accomplish. But then uh, as a from a beauty standpoint as well, you look at the the world of of the gods, or at least the world of Vilokan. So speak. Yeah, Vilokan. There you go. Yeah, I mean the colors, the the atmosphere of it. I mean, it just it was perfect uh, juxtaposition between the two uh, different uh, environments. So, you know, congrats to, to both of you for creating such an, a great series so far. Yeah, it's interesting about the colors because we run the first Kickstarter and it like was was successful, and I'd done the whole coloring for everything. Uh, and I just wasn't happy with it. I was like, this this can be taken to another level if we can find a colorist to make sure that delivery and fulfillment of the Kickstarter isn't delayed too much. But if we can find somebody that can work fast and then actually just bring that other level in. And Anthony Wilson, uh, Go, who's also the colorist for XCT, just brought my line work to an absolute another level. When he's, I, cause I, got, I had a couple of test pages with him, this guy is just going to put this book to a whole nother level and i'm just so glad of what of like working with him as well yeah it's just beautiful what he's done i'm over the moon i can't wait to see what he does with the colors for issue two to be fair pete came at me with a hard sell about redoing the colors because the colors look great when he initially did it they they looked good they were quality that you would see on any comic rack in a comic book shop but he was like I, i'm not comfortable with it this isn't my forte it's not something i feel comfortable with and i was like okay but i mean it looks good and then he showed me some of uh anthony's work the page when it opens up on velocon it's like a, a full page my jaw had dropped the first time when he sent me that page before the colors and then my jaw just fucking fell off when he showed me anthony's work it was just fantastic and he he really makes it pop so we're we're having embarrassment of riches when it comes to uh creators working with us and then there's me so <laughs> the fact that you're you're both creating a great series. The fact that you're both, you're seeing that you can always improve upon the work that you have. And don't sell yourself short, plain and simple. From a creative perspective, and this is for both of you, obviously, because, you know, might as well keep flipping it between you two because you're co-creators. It works out that way. What is your kryptonite when it comes to being creative? My kids. <laughs> <laughs> two kids have to wait for them to go to bed <laughs> my biggest thing would be imposter syndrome that's my biggest downfall is like as, as you were saying it's great that we've been able to like do this stuff and you know i'm, I'm working with casey who's an absolute dream as a career partner to work with you know I, I can see us working together on many projects down the road and we've already got like a well, i think we've got the next five years lined up to be fair yeah. different different <laughs> stuff that we want to work on oh, wow. do you know that nagging voice that you get inside of your head going what are you doing what are you doing with your time Mother. <laughs> <laughs> imposter syndrome is a bugger to be fair whenever you do get that sort of those sorts of thoughts like thankfully i've got cases i can turn to and i'm just like dude my brain is blown at the moment just and you know, we can just have a chat about stuff or thankfully i've got an awesome wife as well they're in the reverse to my kryptonite night my son essentially would be my wife who's just like awesome she's never read a comic that i've done ever which is actually is actually an awesome thing, believe it or not, because what I can do is I'll lay out a page of pencils. Babe, what's going on in that? And she'll be like, well, he starts there, does that, does that, does that, ends up there. I'm like, cool. If you can understand that and she doesn't like comics, then anyone that understands the language of comics will totally get that. I was gonna I was gonna say though, how does your significant others handle your creativity? With lots of patience. <laughs> 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 My, mine's awesome we don't have kids as opposed to uh casey she knows that creating comics is something that i've always been passionate about ever since i was like i was literally one of these art artists that were drawing before they could write uh, i was really ill as a kid five major operations by the time i was four so my 
develop my education developmentally was like really far behind but I used to communicate through drawings and so she knows that this is something I've always wanted to do and it's like my life and outside of her it's like literally it's her then comics is literally my life yeah she's awesome and totally supportive my my wife read something i wrote for the, like the first time a few weeks ago when we got at issue one of voodoo child in she had never really showed an interest i think kind of resented like the time i would spend doing the comic stuff and i'm sure she still does a little bit i can't not be creative i've always been in bands and written for a time I wanted to be a comic artist but then I realized I sucked but I'm sure a lot of people kind of realize that that love comics but she sat down and read the first issue and I was kind of like waiting for reaction and the reaction I got was very like affirming and it made me feel really good that she liked it and then she was like what happens next and uh, so I, I told her the ending of the, the first series. She was like, that is fucking wicked. <laughs> so ju just her reaction on like my sweet, you know, kindergarten teaching wife, realizing that she liked it and wanted to know more about it made me feel really good. Like we, we have two small children. They, they need a lot of time. Um, I, I usually don't start doing anything like writing wise until they're in bed. I wake up at four. So I try to go to bed at like midnight at least. Um, so I have, you know, an hour and a half to write. That can be rough, especially when like I have an idea that I need to get out. In what early experience did you learn that language had power? I love these questions, Kurt. They're good, man. Um... I suppose the, my early experience with language having power was uh, when I was in, I don't know what you guys, we call it junior school here, like the school you go to before you go to high school. For, I was brought up very evangelical Christian and like swearing just wasn't in my household at all. So much so that I was like on the school playground, I just wouldn't swear, I just wouldn't do it. But I used to get picked on for this. I remember one time being held up against the wall, like by this um, girl, two grades above me. And she had me around the neck and she was like picking on me. And I was just like, why don't you just F off? And <laughs> she, was, she was so shocked by me using that language that she basically stopped picking on me because she was just like, ah, oh, okay. He is human after all and like not a complete douche. And yeah, I suppose that would be more of my first experiences of like what you can achieve through language. Around the same age, I went to a bookstore in uh, Birmingham, Alabama. They had a, um, a contest for worst opening line to a detective novel. So, of course, you know, if you don't know how to write, anything you write is going to probably be one of the worst anyway. I was around 11 or 12. I put my thing in the bucket that, you know, my line. A few weeks later, I got a call that I had gotten second place. The first place was a local writer named Robert R. McCammon, who, uh, if you're into horror, he has done some pretty big books. So he, he wrote Boy's Life, Gone South, ton of other like really good horror and horror adjacent books. Realizing that uh, my bad opening line was almost as good as a professional writer's bad opening line gave me all the confidence I needed to write more bad opening lines. <laughs> You remember what the line was? Yeah. It was a dark and stormy night. A dame walked into my office. Yeah. She was ugly, real ugly, which is cheating <laughs> because that's totally more than an opening line. Uh, his was get it up, cried the gal with the gat. They were nice enough to give me the uh, the benefit of the doubt because I'm sure my handwriting looked like that of an 11-year-old. Hey, I mean, take, take wins where you can get Exactly, it. I mean, exactly. It set you on this particular path. Do you think that someone could actually be a writer if they don't feel emotion. I've been accused of being an emotional robot by my wife before. I try to be as reserved as possible when it comes to the heavy stuff. Doesn't mean that I don't feel. As a man, especially a man in the South, you learn to bottle shit up. I think that's destructive and toxic as hell. It's definitely not healthy. I think if, if you, you truly can't find emotions and you can't in inject that into your writing is it's going to suffer you may as well be writing like a, a parts manual or something i work in a software company and i know for certain <laughs> after speaking to 
like not just my this current software company I work in, but other software companies, developers are an interesting breed. They also like to write <laughs> technical specs, and you you can whether or not you can do creative writing is a different matter. But uh, you can definitely write. From a creative point of view, could you be a writer if you didn't have a emotional arsenal to fall back on? I suppose you could, but you would need obviously a second pair of eyes to actually help you get there and pull that through a little bit what did you edit out of this book because obviously editing is a <laughs> a so lot you save that for other volumes so we were a good chunk into issue one about 12 pages in i basically looked at the script and i wanted to pad everything out like tons so i ended up redrawing crazy is great to work with as a writer because he'll quite he'll quite happily let me just have a bash at doing the writing because i do like to do writing myself as well so he'll quite happily let me like just chuck some ideas down and go yeah cool let's run with it see what happens let's have a look i ended up reworking some of the script for issue one and pacing out a lot of stuff so the opening page essentially of voodoo child as it is now turned into three pages the scene all the way up to where the grenade grows goes off on page five turned into 10 pages. And essentially it was going to be, if I'd carried on down that route, I think it would have ended up about 80 pages just for the first issue. Which, yeah, yeah. You know, isn't, isn't a bad thing and would have been interesting. And there's some really like lovely pages, um, even if I do say so myself, that I've got in my um, art drawer. But then I was just like, yeah, this is going to take a year and a half just to do issue one. And we've got this planned as a five issue arc. Let's go back to your script case because it makes a lot more sense. The initial page one, the page one that you read did not exist in my initial script. My original idea was to just drop them right into the shit and just have chaos on, you, you flip that first page, boom, chaos has erupted. Pete suggested that we kind of do an introduction page. He's like, man, you, you kind of need to show some characterization first and get people grounded and let them know where they're at. I'm glad I listened to them because that first, A, that first page is beautiful. B, it kind of allowed you to see some calm and then immediately get shocked by the, the craziness and go like, oh, the people aren't going to make it through this book. In addition to that though, there was a lot that I cut out of issue one, subsequently issue two, because I, I just didn't have room for it in the story that I wanted to tell. I have characters and plot lines that I want to get to, more than likely going to end up in the, um, the second series that we do, which will take, it'll take place 10 years on down the line. It's one of those things where I was wrestling with a problem, thinking about it, and it seems like every time that I come to a, uh, a solution, I'm in the shower. Oh, shit, I know exactly what to do. And then I nearly break my neck trying to get out of the shower so I can write it down before I forget. Um, to Mike, Michael Straczynski, Michael Strzinsk, I can never say Strzinsk, that. Guy. Strzinski. Thank you. That's where, all, <laughs> I, that's where all the best ideas come from when you're in the shower. And he's bald, like, so he has less shower time. Exactly. Like yeah, for him, Babylon 5, <laughs> Babylon 5, he was wrestling with two stories and then he was in the shower and actually went, oh yeah, they can actually just be one. The gray noise of the shower beating down on you. Is there anything else that I haven't asked that you'd like to share with those that are listening and watching this show? Pete and I met via a group called The Comic Jam. It is a online workshop, uh, allows creators a chance to meet up with people who also create, but don't know other writers, don't know other artists. And we pair those people together. I kind of do a lot of behind the scenes stuff there. And when Pete asked to join, I thought he was pulling my leg because his art was so well developed and just so light years ahead of uh, where I thought, you know, the group was. Then he did a few comics with us. And then like a year later, he asked if, if I wanted to do a comic with him, which blew my mind. But yeah, the Comic Jam is a great place. So check that out if you can. Yeah, it's, it's an awesome forum for people who are interested in creating comics, have want to do comics, but have no idea on A, how to do them, B, if they have the talent, everyone's got the talent. So you can join it for free. It's a great community. It's all on Discord. The community is absolutely awesome and you just learn so much so quickly. So don't be afraid. Just dive in and get involved. 
Everyone has one or two people that inspire them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? For where I am today, as I said earlier, my wife is a huge inspiration. Without her, I wouldn't be doing comics. I never had the confidence to do them beforehand. I always wanted to do them, but I never had the confidence to do them. So she was just, just get out there and do it. You've only got one life. About 10 years back, I lost a close friend due to um, mental illness. That shook me up and made me realize that you have only got one life. And it's because of him and my wife that I had the inspiration to actually do it and just keep on plugging away and keep on doing it. I, I don't know, man, that's, that's a hard, it's a hard thing. I, I feel like a lot of the times it, it, you don't realize it at the time, but there's so many people that come into your life that help to nurture and like propel you into something that you never considered comics when I was a kid growing up, I never thought that I would be doing any of this because comics existed in New York in Los Angeles. Like if you didn't live in either of those two places or like within like easy transit to there, you were screwed that it just wasn't in the cards for you because of like the internet. That shit's not true anymore. Not only has uh, my wife been like really just helpful and understanding with me, you know, putting, you know, an hour or two a week into doing stuff um, for interviews for like spoiler country and stuff like that. She's also understanding like, Hey, you know, he has a create, he has this creative drive that uh, if he doesn't get to do that stuff, that he'll probably be an asshole. So probably just let him write. Um, Pete is a self-starter. And um, he had gotten out there and done a ton of comics before, uh, before we met up. Pete has also been very instrumental in this because I didn't, I didn't think I was good enough to write for Pete. And uh, there is uh, another, a, a writer friend of mine named Matt Sumo, who uh, hopefully you have on your show soon. He's amazing. He also got out there and did some stuff in press that was, uh, it really impressed me. And then the guys, John and Kenrick at uh, Spoiler Country, if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't have known that comics isn't that big of a stretch, you know, getting stuff done like this. I've, I've gotten to talk to a lot of really, really interesting people and they've, they've really inspired me in, in regards to creating stuff. From a professional perspective, you have now created volume one and two of Voodoo Child. You have planned to create more works in the future. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Like, so success, you know, it can be measured so many different ways. As far as like what we're aiming to do with Voodoo Child, I, I definitely feel like we're successful in that the idea of even creating a comic was so far in the left field. I didn't think it was attainable up until recently. So the fact that we're able to get this out, our first issue was completely funded within 12 hours. And uh, I'm hoping to uh, re have a repeat success with this, uh, this Kickstarter for issue number two. I, I feel we're successful. I feel like we are moving in the right direction. Uh, I feel like we're, we're going where we need to go. Personally successful, I totally do for the chance to be able to work with great writers like Casey. Um, as much as he praises the stuff that I've brought to the table, he's brought equally as much. The book wouldn't exist without both of us putting in like 100%. I, I personally am successful in like the how I feel fulfilled in like the creative stuff that we're doing in regards to the project. I'd say that it's definitely got legs. We've got a lot of things planned for the future. And if it continues on the trajectory that it's gone so far, it's got definitely on its way to being successful as well. And it's through like, you know, talking to great people like yourself and the great support of the community and the comics community that we've been receiving that hopefully as a joint effort, all of us can help make um, all independent creators follow their own dreams and be successful that way. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? I like things failing sometimes because things never truly fail. You have a different result from what you wanted, but everything is a learning opportunity. Nothing is a failure because there's always something that can be learned. For instance, 
when we launch the Kickstarter, as Casey said, on Friday the 13th, next Friday, that'll be the second time we've launched the Kickstarter for issue two. The first time we launched it, we had a goal of £3,000, which I think, given the conversion rate from US GBP to US... 4300 <laughs> something like that. Yeah, something like that. With 15 days to go, it just didn't feel like we were going to make it. We were in the dead zone. Then we had one of the a huge backer drop out. And I was just like, do you know what? This isn't going to do it. Let's just pull the plug, reassess, rebuild the campaign, and let's just go again. And some people could view that as a failure. Me, I just look at it as a learning opportunity to just go, okay, cool. The goal we had, we weren't going to hit, but that's basically because the audience we've got, we just isn't big enough for that sort of goal yet. So let's just reassess pile back on some stuff and just go again when you're met with uh, what could be called a failure or whatever yeah i mean it, it sucks it hurts but you can't take stuff too seriously in my day job i work with engineers we're having to make stuff from scratch and build this stuff a failure in my job is just like another data set that we have we go oh well Obviously, this didn't work, so let's figure out what we can do to make it work and avoid the steps that didn't work. If you're learning from your mistakes and learning what works and what does not, then uh, you can't fail. You're, you're just, you know, it might take you a little bit longer to reach your goal, but you're getting there. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? What, one thing that I, I would say to anybody who wants to do anything is just shut up and do it. If you talk about doing something, but don't put it into action, then it's never going to get done. We have a lot of people, th this kind of goes in with uh, the comic jam because we have a lot of people come in with this big idea for a comic. And it's all they think about. And they're so excited about this comic. They don't write the damn comic. They don't even start, not even page one. They want you to write the comic for them. And it, it doesn't work that way. You have to apply yourself and apply that drive into making the, you know, the idea, the metaphysical, this, you know, nebulous thing in the back of your head you have to put that on the page and uh, until you do that you're just you're just blasting out hot air so if you want to inspire people if you want to get people excited about anything you have to be doing it yourself you you can't lead from behind you actually have to get out there and you know grab the bull by the horns wrestle it to the ground or you know whatever you would do with bulls i'm not a, i'm not a rodeo person yeah just to mirror what casey was saying there essentially um to for inspiration for another generation i was i my artwork was inspired by um uk guys like brian bolland steve dillon all those sorts of things and what we've tried what we've tried to do with Voodoo Child is basically do a homage to the classics or Vertigo comics like Preacher, for instance. And I was totally inspired by Preacher when I was a kid. And if anyone looked at Voodoo Child and they were like, this is sick, I want to grow up and make comics like this, I would be over the moon. You can't just think about doing it. You just need to do it because... I, I, I've got some images and I might be actually, I'm thinking about I'm um, on my um, Instagram actually getting up a uh, throwback Thursday and actually going through, back through some of my old work because it's absolutely terrible. But <laughs> it's great because it, even though it's terrible, it shows progression and it shows like, you know, you just need to go out there, do it. If ever you're worried about this whole breaking into comics, that's just absolute nonsense the moment you break into comics is the moment you actually start bloody making them that's when you break into comics if you can't find a seat at the table you got to make your own damn chair by making your own chair is is putting together a portfolio putting together a collection of things that you have done so that you can show people this is what i have this is where i have invested my creativity notice me senpai no one's gonna laugh at you no one's gonna go oh really Exactly. Everyone has done it. Everyone's taken their port. Well, back when Comic Cons were a thing, been in the before times, everyone has taken their portfolio to Comic Con and gone down Artist Alley and gone to artists that they love and gone, 
excuse me, would you possibly mind, like, ter- well, if they're British, they would. Uh, excuse me, would, you possi- <laughs> would, you, would you possibly mind terribly looking at my artwork? Thank you very much. And then go and run behind a, the nearest big person you can find whilst they looked at it and, you know, had feedback. No artist that I know of um, would actually go, no, it's a piece of shit because everyone's done it. Everyone's been at that beginning spot, uh, but you need to be at that beginning spot to get anywhere. Well, I do hate to say it, you guys, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. It's been a blast having you both on. I will have you both on in the future. Awesome. Uh, if I don't reach out to you guys, but reach out to me and I will make sure you have a spot here. Before I let you both go, where can we find, of course, Voodoo Child and, and any of your other social medias? The Voodoo Child, uh, at The Voodoo Child on Twitter, at The Voodoo Child on Instagram, Voodoo, Ch- Voodoo, Voodoo Child Comic dot com, Voodoo Child on Facebook. Yeah. Yes, Voodoo Child underscore Comic on Insta. But more importantly, where you can find it at the moment is issue two dot Voodoo Child Comic dot com because that's the landing page for issue two Kickstarter. That's where you want to be. I'm, I'm uh, PL Woods. I'm on PL Woods Comics on everything essentially. Yeah, so. and I am Robots Eat Guitar. Robots Eat Guitar. Well, uh, again, thank you guys for coming on the show. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking and uh, support their Kickstarter campaign on Friday the 13th. And of course, as I say every week, you can find this interview and thousands of others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word two, not the number two. And everyone has the story to tell and it's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks again for listening and watching to everyone on Two Geeks Talking. Hey, all Kurt Sasso here from Two Geeks Talking. If you like this video and these quick clips here, make sure you take a look at our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash TGT Media. Make sure you hit the like button and subscribe as well. Hit the bell to make sure you get notifications, of course, from videos like this here. Thank you everyone for listening and watching over the years and keep listening and watching for new and exciting interviews with talented and creative people in the entertainment industry. I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. Thank you so much.